to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja and in this brief video I will continue my conversation on Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Thank you so much for joining me and if you are not subscribed to the channel please do feel free to subscribe so that you can stay updated. And if you are new to this lecture series, all you need to do is go into my playlists and then click on the playlist on Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and all the lectures would line up. This actually is the third part of my lecture on chapter one. And now the process that we are following here is that I'm actually reading from the text page by page, paragraph by paragraph, line by line, and hence talking about it. Now in the previous two lectures, we have already covered the sort of the binaristic structure that he explains of the oppressor and the oppressed, and the way he posits the human need to seek full humanization, which is, for Freire, a natural human tendency, and which comes against the unnatural outside forces of dehumanization. And in the process of struggling for that, what he also suggests is that the oppressed, first of all, need to become aware of their own oppression and their dehumanization. Then, as they struggle for their full, authentic, in his words, humanization, they also have to take into account that they are not just liberating themselves, they are also liberating their oppressors because they are also dehumanized because they are dehumanizing other people. And where I had left the last ch chapter was on that instructive line. And that is where he's trying to explain how would such a praxis of liberation be possible? How would the oppressed know of their own oppression and figure out a method of liberating themselves, and that's where he, get, he says, and I'm reading, uh, uh, you know, that, that the oppressed are caught in this duality, part of their alliances, their aspirations are aligned with the oppressive system, but then they also have a desire to be free, and it is this duality that they are caught in. And this is the tragic dilemma, and I'm reading, this is where we had ended the last lecture. This is the tragic dilemma of the oppressed which their education must take into account. So here is where he will now start talking about the pedagogy of the oppressed. Now you might have noticed that I'm recording on a different uh, platform because the earlier videos had some problems. So I'm recording it through an app on my phone which does not allow me to share screen, but I will be posting pictures of the text right here in post editing so by the time this gets to you you probably can see the text that I am reading okay so I will continue reading the next paragraph and then talk about it this book will present some aspects of what the writer has termed the pedagogy of the oppressed so that's writer of course is Freire himself a pedagogy which must be forged with not for the oppressed, a pedagogy which must be forged with and not for the oppressed, and that's really crucial. So first of all, he's telling us this book would address this question, this question of the pedagogy of the oppressed, but it is not a top-down pedagogy. It is not for the oppressed. It's not one of those recipes that we give to people, here is how poor can change their lives, here is how women can, you know, be equal. No, no. This is not pedagogy for the oppressed, but with the oppressed. That is in solidarity with the oppressed, right? And that is crucial, that this pedagogy must be in solidarity with the oppressed and must also be informed by their experience their thoughts and things that they themselves have discovered, right? And then in parenthesis, whether individuals or people, right? In the incessant struggle to regain their humanity. So first of all, this pedagogy is the pedagogy of the oppressed. It is not for the oppressed, it doesn't come from top down, but it is with the oppressed. 
and it is in solidarity with their constant struggle to regain their full humanity. Cool. I continue reading. This pedagogy makes oppression and its causes objects of reflection by the oppressed. And from that reflection will come their necessary engagement in the struggle for their liberation. So another instructive line or sentence here, that this pedagogy, right, its object of study, object of reflection, is the structures of oppressions themselves. But it's not Masood Raja sitting at his university reading the object, the, 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 the structures of, no. As understood and reflected upon by the oppressed themselves, that's instructive. The, the insights must come from them. And from that reflection will come their necessary engagement in the struggle for their liberation. Okay. And in the struggle, this pedagogy will be made and remade. So this is the pedagogy of the oppressed. But it is a pedagogy of praxis. And that praxis is led by the oppressed themselves, their way of thinking about their own oppression. And it is informed by that. But it is also not fixed because as the struggle develops, as the oppressed develop their ways of critically looking at the reality outside of them, right? The pedagogy must shift accordingly, so it cannot be a fixed system of pedagogy. No ten lines of this is how to do pedagogy of the oppressed. So this is, I think, a crucial paragraph. Now, on a side note, I mean, those of you who have read your Foucault, your Derrida, the post-structuralist, even the post-structuralist Marxist, we are already having certain problems with the way Freire is using these vocabularies, right, of authentic self. Right? The problem is, in the post-structuralist world, the question of the authentic self itself becomes problematic, right? If we know discourse and that we are over-determined by discursive situations, even though Freire is clearly positing that the consciousness of the oppressed is structured by the structures of oppression in which they, they exist, to a level that they internalize the logic of that oppression and function accordingly. So it's not as simple, but keep that in mind. Another uh, thing problematic is the experiential aspects of identity. Now, if you have read uh, Can the Subaltern Speak or watched my series of lectures on it, if you have read, you know, Lacan, we already know that the experience alone, we cannot access it without language and without the symbolic order. So the question of knowing things simply experientially is deeply problematic in post-structuralism because that access to that is through language, through a discourse, through the symbolic order. So then our access to the real, even what we are experiencing, is mediated through larger structures of ideology. And how do we get out of that? Probably this is not the place to answer it, but keep the, those complications in mind, right? So I'm not trying to oversimplify Freire, but these are the things that you, me, and anyone else who lives in a post-structuralist paradigm will immediately start thinking, right? So we go to the next paragraph. The central problem is this, okay? How can the oppressed as divided unauthentic beings participate in developing the pedagogy of their liberation. Now, by inauthentic beings, you know, what he basically means is that these are, and it's a very humanistic claim, that these are beings who are not reconciled with their self, with their own humanity, because their own sense of self even and their place in the world is overdetermined by the structure of oppression in which they exist. So the authentic self would then be which is reconciled with itself, right? And which is not over-determined by the structures of power, structures of oppression that determine it. So that's some distinction to me. But how will they develop this pedagogy? How? Only as they discover this themselves to be the host of the oppressor 
can they contribute to the midwifery of their liberating pedagogy? How? By first acknowledging that that oppressive system, the oppressor, it's not just outside of them, it lives within them, right? It's lodged within their self. So first recognition is then to question the very system of thought, system of reflection, the logical way of looking at the world. All of it is being seen from the point of view of the oppressor because the oppressor, as we learned in the previous lecture, has been lodged into the consciousness. And this is very clearly also like you can see that in you know, Marx's explanation of class, right? That, or Marx's idea of ideology, right? As this epistemological veil that makes the workers look at the world from the point of view of the dominant classes because they have been overdetermined by the ideology of the dominant classes. So in that epistemological model of ideology, the purpose was to lift the veil so that the workers could actually see their own experience from the point of view of their own class interests. So this is a re reworking of that, right? And I continue reading. As long as they live in the duality, they means the oppressed, in which to be is to be like. And to be like is to be like the oppressor, right? So the duality is that the question of being then for the oppressed is not being who they are, but being like someone else, right? Because the identity that they inhabit is imposed from outside forces which they have internalized. So they are not necessarily being themselves, they are being like someone else and that someone else is the oppressor because that is the system within which they are performing that identity. So this is the duality in which the oppressed exists. So if they exist in it, how would they become aware of that? And next, how would then they develop a pedagogy that can liberate them, right? Cool. So I'll read again. A duality in which to be is to be like, and to be like is to be like the oppressors. This contribution is impossible, right? Within this duality, the contribution to a liberating pedagogy is impossible. The pedagogy of the oppressed, I'm reading, is an instrument for their critical discovery that both they and their oppressors are manifestations of dehumanization. So the project of critical pedagogy or pedagogy of the oppressed then is for the oppressed to realize that they are a product of an oppressive system. But not just they, that those who oppress them are also part of that dehumanizing process. So not only are the oppressed dehumanized, but in the process of dehumanizing them, of course, the oppressors themselves have been dehumanized too, and it is an acknowledgement of that. Going on to the next paragraph then, liberation is thus a childbirth and a painful one. The man or woman who emerges is a new person, viable only as the oppressor-oppressed contradiction is superseded by the humanization of all people. So this struggle of liberation, it cannot be reform, reform only. It cannot just be surface changes. What he's asking for is rewriting the world, right? Re-establishing the social order in which that oppressor oppressed dichotomy doesn't exist, right? And hence that is going to be a painful process. Painful process how? The oppressors have to learn not to be oppressors, right? And the oppressed have to learn to be free individuals and collectives, but at the same time take on the responsibility of liberating the oppressors too and not become oppressors themselves in the process, right? Hence, it's a childbirth, it's painful, but it's also something new coming into the world, right? And it is viable only if the humanization project 
focuses both on the oppressed as well as the oppressors because both are dehumanized in this unjust system. Okay, and I read. Or to put it another way, the solution of this contradiction is born in the labor which brings into the world this new being. No longer oppressor nor oppressed, but human in the process of achieving freedom. Right? So the true liberation then will come when we and the oppressed and the oppressors have escaped that binary structure and created a new form of humanity, a humanity which is not defined by that duality of oppressor and oppressed. And that's a revolutionary idea in terms of education because think of what we do in the world, what our leaders tell us, what our liberal professors, I am one of them, tell us, right? Every time we suggest something, we are suggesting surface changes. Be kind, be generous, right? While we live in an oppressive order, in an unjust world order in which, you know, people die of starvation, disease, hunger, war, famine, and we are okay with it. We continue living and keep assuming that we are living productive lives. Mostly we liberals, right, and, or leftists. I'm not even talking about conservative people. They have their own worldviews. But the idea is this new humanity will emerge only when the larger structures have been altered to a point where the dichotomy, the duality of oppressor and the oppressed no longer exists. And that is the function of pedagogy of the oppressed. And that pedagogy will be led by the oppressed, right? Keep that in mind. Going to the next paragraph. This solution cannot be achieved in idealistic terms. In order for the oppressed to be able to wage the struggle for their liberation, they must perceive the reality of oppression not as a closed world from which there is no exit, but as a limiting situation which they can transform. Okay, first of all, it cannot just be idealistic terms. We can't just write papers about it and discuss it. No, it has to be a praxis, right? And in the process of thinking the liberation, the oppressed must learn to think that this is not something that they are destined to be in, that the world is not immutable, right? Or that the world is not always like this. I mean, the possibility of liberation absolutely depends on this hope and this belief that whatever injustices exist in the world, whatever system exists in the world, it can be changed, it can be transformed, right? So that possibility of change has to be part of this praxis, part of this pedagogy, right? And, and the first way of thinking about it is to think critically about a system, but also believe that it can be changed. Now think of it this way, how does it apply in our own lives? Uh, I have encountered so many people in my life, highly educated people, um, they work within a given system, right? And within that they perform their activities, evaluate their peers, right? write reports on the people who work for them. But have you noticed how many of them actually question the very practices that the system encourages or forces them to do? No, most of us usually follow a given system of rules and function in, and our energies are mostly spent on enforcing those rules. Very few of us actually go out and think the system itself and talk about whether it's a just system or not. If you have been an education major in the United States of America at any college or university, think back, what is it that they were teaching you? Were they teaching you to rethink the educational system? I'm pretty sure not. What they were training you through practicums, but also through classroom instruction, was how to perform within the given system that exists, right? The question here is, we have to go a step beyond. The oppressed must internalize this idea that the system in which they exist is not immutable. They already know it is imperfect 
and only then that system can be transformed. And that perception is absolutely necessary so that, that the system can be changed and transformed, right? And I go on and read more. This perception is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for liberation, right? This idea that the system must be changed and transformed, it is necessary, but it's not, it does not cover everything. It must become the motivating force for liberating action, right? Nor does the discovery by the oppressed that they exist in dialectical relationship to the oppressor as his antithesis, that without them the oppressor could not exist in itself constitute liberation. Now this is a brilliant insight. So the relationship between the oppressor and oppressed is dialectical and if you have read your Hegel you already know there is a thesis and its other is the antithesis, right? The thesis goes and seeks its own antithesis, consumes it and creates a synthesis which becomes a new thesis, right? That voracious ego, Hegelian ego. But the discovery of this dialectic is not enough, right? Uh, to claim that the oppressor needs the oppressed to define them is not going to change anything. And that's a very important point. Think of it, post-colonial studies, feminism and others, Derrida, we have already read the claims that it's not the center that determines the periphery, it's the periphery that determines the center. The entire project of Orientalism and Said was the idea that Europe needed its global others, its colonies, right, to constitute itself. We already know it, right? But knowing that, has that led to liberation, right? No. Are all our ac academic debates about it and everything, why doesn't it? Because it lacks praxis, right? There is no politics that is informed by that and then goes and alters the world. And that's the point that he's talking about, right? That this discovery alone is not going to be, this discovery of this idea that the system must be altered, must be transformed, and that the oppressed exist in this dialectical relationship with their oppressors, knowing that alone is not going to change things, not going to achieve liberation. So what is, and he says, the oppressed can overcome that contradiction in which they are caught, the contradiction of being oppressed, a part of that a contradiction when he uses that term, it already assumes that dialectical relationship. Caught only when this perception enlists them in the struggle for freedom, to free themselves, right? So knowledge is one component, reflection another, knowing how the system is arrayed, what is the dialectical relationship with the, between the oppressed and the oppressor is the beginning point. And, but it is not complete in itself. It must be guided by struggle to freedom, right, and a pedagogy of the oppressed, right, will focus on that, how to develop it, how to learn about it, how to construct a pedagogy of the oppressed that is based in praxis, right, works towards liberation of individuals and collectives, but also liberation and humanization of the oppressors themselves, right. And this is how far I can go on page 49 today. Uh, but let me read another paragraph maybe and that will be good for us. So the next paragraph, the same is true with respect to the individual oppressor as a person. So it's true, this logic, you know, of liberation is true for individual persons as well. Discovering so just as it applies to the oppressed, it also applies to the oppressors. Discovering himself to be an oppressor may cause considerable anguish, right? Just as when the oppressed 
individual or collective discovers that they are oppressed, it leads them to reflect upon the system itself or their own condition in it. The same rules apply to the oppressor. Discovering himself to be an oppressor may cause considerable anguish, but it does not necessarily lead to solidarity with the oppressed. Right? I mean, you, you can read so many accounts of the British liberals and others, the colonizers, who actually acknowledge that the colonial system is an exploitative system, it's brutal, right? But that alone does not change their own worldview, but absolutely does not lead them to change the world around them, right? It can may call them, cause them maybe some moral quandary. I mean, think of all the American revolutionary politicians uh, whom we quote and cite, right? Um, but they were also slave owners. So on one hand, they were great scholars, right? And they understood the inhumanity of the system in the South, right? But that didn't encourage them to take the ultimate step of saying, if slavery is wrong, I shouldn't own 400 slaves, right? But that anguish was there, how the slaves were mistreated and all, right? That alone doesn't solve the problem. Uh, discovering himself to be an oppressor may cause considerable anguish, but it does not necessarily lead to solidarity with the oppressed. Rationalizing his guilt through paternalistic treatment of the oppressed, all the while holding them fast in a position of dependence, will not do. Right? So, so all these people in powerful positions right who continue talking about the poor and how they need help right and then keep criticizing their own privileged position that that doesn't accomplish anything unless they work in solidarity with the oppressed to change the system in which they inhabit the place of the oppressor right so there is a there is like a wonderful critique of bourgeois liberalism here, okay, bourgeois, the kind of bourgeois liberalism um, that will have us read poetry and go and watch operas and things and assume that simply because we patronize art, we are somehow better than our conservative brothers and sisters. And you know, I'm saying this as a leftist liberal myself, right? I'm guilty of the same feeling that we just do these cosmetic gestures but never really question our place within the oppressive order of the world and even if we question it we rationalize it right instead we do false charity and false generosity that we already talked about okay solidarity requires that one enter one enter into the situation of those with whom one is solidarity right it is a radical posture so if you are going to claim solidarity with the oppressed you can't do it from your exalted position no solidarity requires that one enter the house of the individual and group that you are in solidarity with right it is a radical posture it's not something that we do in our drawing rooms. It's to stand with, enter the world of the oppressed and stand with them. Think of it, you know, the early abolitionist movement, right? These people were privileged, they were white, but when time came, right, some of them actually went and stood with the slaves, right? That kind of solidarity is what he's talking about. It is a radical posture. It is radical because you're trying to transform the world by actually leaving your place of privilege and entering the place of the other with whom you are in solidarity, right? That's why it's radical. And there, are, there is like a whole chapter on radicality itself. I have a brief lecture on it. You can watch it, but we will get to that as we read this more and more. If what characterizes the oppressed is their subordination to the consciousness of the master, as Hegel affirms, so that's master-slave dialectic in Hegel, you can read it. True solidarity with the oppressed means fighting at their side, 
to transform the objective reality which has made them these beings for another. I'll stop here, right? So true solidarity then on the part of the oppressing class is not necessarily just write essays about it and feel bad about it. It is to actually stand in solidarity with the oppressed, with your others, right? And then fight the system that have created them as this other, right? That is locked them in this master-slave dialectic, right? So this is Freire at his best, right? Having given us what the project of education ought to be to humanize ourselves, that that must be informed by the oppressed themselves, that the pedagogy that will do that is not a pedagogy for the oppressed, but it is pedagogy with the oppressed, and that within that, while the oppressed must dislodge the oppressive structures within their souls, so to speak, the oppressor must do that too. And that any kind of solidarity on part of the oppressor with the oppressed cannot just be theoretical, cannot just be idealistic. It has to be practical. It has to have a praxis in which they, in various words, enter the world of the oppressed and stand in solidarity with them. So. I'll stop here um, and I hope this was useful to you and you know any questions that you have please send them my way post them in the comments and as I said in my previous lectures the best way to encounter these lectures or benefit from these is of course if you read along I'm using the 30th anniversary edition Right now we have covered only up to page 49 and I'll continue to the next pages of chapter 1 in my next lecture. Until then, if you have any questions, send them my way. And as always, I'm grateful that you're part of my life virtually uh, through this medium and I hope you're all staying safe and I hope to see you next time. If you have a moment, please do subscribe and other than that, stay safe and until the next time, peace and love.